let's start immediately. Well, in front of us, we have a illustration of the characteristics of a tropical cyclone. We left off there last, last time where we did the, 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 pres the cross section of a mid latitude cyclone. Oh, sorry, sorry, of a tropical cyclone. So I just would like to start there again. Um, right. -o. So the last time we said that tropical cyclone starts uh, about five to eight degrees south or north of the equator. Our reason that we said it started there is that we need Coriolis falls so that we can start so that the vortex of a tropical cyclone can start. So if we don't have um, Coriolis falls, then unfortunately we don't have that reflection of wind or water. So that is why we have Coriolis falls that is away from the equator, so about five, eight uh, degrees south or north of the equator. Then we said it starts over the ocean and it starts over the tropics. Now the ocean needs to be about 26, 27 degrees Celsius. That is, so if you say plus minus 26, 27 degrees Celsius, then that will be acceptable. Okay, you, you need warm water and most of our or let me say all of our of our tropical cyclone starts on the east coast of all of our uh, continents. OK, then we go further and then we say it moves from east to west and it's been driven. It's driven by the easterlies, so it moves from east to west. And remember that the mid latitude cyclone moves again from the west to east. OK, and then also as it moves from east to west, it moves away from the equator. OK. Then, OK, there we have it. And then we have the eye. Now, boys and girls, the eye is that centerpiece in the middle of that circle. OK, now in the eye, we say there's no wind, there's no rain, there's no clouds. OK, temperature will increase. Um, and then also, uh, yes, our temperature increased. We will have, well, uh, pressure will also drop or decrease. OK, that's in the eye, so you need to know what happens in the eye, ladies and gentlemen. So then we go over to Madagascar and maybe we'll lose a little bit of uh, energy, but not tremendously that we can say it won't have an impact because Madagascar in the South Indian Ocean is and, and Mozambique are the two uh, areas that is hit hard by tropical cyclones during the summertime or late summertime, early autumn. So around about now we will see um, tropical cyclones appear in the South Indian Ocean that will have an impact on the weather conditions of Madagascar and Mozambique. OK, then it moves further and when it gets to the 30 degrees south of the equator, then it turns east. And then the reason that I said to you guys that it turns east because now it moves into the westerlies. So the western wind or the western belt is now forcing it now to move in an easterly direction. Ladies and gentlemen, destruction of notes, strong winds, you will get flooding, people will lose their houses. Um, and the one, one quick, oh, they we say, the question that you can expect here is the impact of tropical cyclones on the environment, on infrastructure, on people, and then also what will the, the economic impact have? Remember, if there was destruction, then we need to put all that infrastructure again in place. So that costs money. People that lost their houses, uh, insurance have to pay out, now the insurance say, oh, once again, so people have to fork up money so that they can make sure that they can put whatever they had in the past, that they can put that in place again. OK, um, then dissipating means that it disappear because it does not have no moisture, no warm air friction, because now that, that is now quite a distance from the top, from the equator. So Water is now much colder in this area, and that is why that will dissipate because it can't pick up any moisture, it can't pick up any warm air. And now, because the water is also colder, then there will be friction between the vortex and the cold water. 
Man, now the question that was raised a couple of years ago, and some of my colleagues that's very good with it, they can remember in the years, what years certain question appear in certain papers. Um, they ask, why does, why does, doesn't tropical cyclones appear in the South Atlantic Ocean? The answer there, the water is too cold. Remember, if we look at the uh, west coast of South Africa, Atlantic Ocean is there, and we get the cold Benguela that runs past the west coast of South Africa. That water comes from the polar regions, and that is cold water. And remember now that a tropical cyclone needs warm water, and that is why we don't find tropical cyclones in the South Atlantic Ocean. Okay, now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to go to. I think we've start. We we answered the question on page seven the last time, but I would like you to go to page eight for me. There's a few questions there for uh, on page eight. Let me just get there quickly. Evan, that's page eight. Okay, so. There you have an illustration of the total of tropical cyclones that appeared in that region. Okay, that is the uh, the east coast of South America, the Gulf of Mexico, and that is in the northern hemisphere. Okay, there we have the Atlantic Ocean. So now we can see the path of the tropical cyclone moving towards um, the land. And look at the symbol. Remember what I said to you, you need to know the symbol. Now, they, the questions that's asked there, 2.31, how many tropical cyclones occur in 2050 seas, 2015 season? And then also, why do tropical cyclones move in a westerly direction? Give the term used to refer to tropical cyclones in this part of the world. What is the name of tropical cyclones in that part of the world? And then two conditions that promote the development of tropical cyclones. OK, Dylan, are you going to take over there just to see what schools are we going to ask to answer these four questions for us? Um, yes, so, so I would advise that um, Florida High, if you can maybe attempt that to answer that question. If you don't want to send a WhatsApp, you can also either raise your hand or post it in the comment section. Any other school that can start with question two, Salam, and three? We don't have an answer yet, Dylan. I think to avoid wasting time, so okay, if after, let's continue. Yeah, then if no one else answers, you can just go ahead and answer it. OK, right. 2.31, they say there's five in that season. Why five, ladies and gentlemen? Come, let's look at the names of the tropical cyclones that we have. If you go, go right to the northern part of that map, you will see Claudette. Then we have, if we move more to the coastline, we have Anna. And then deeper into the Gulf of Mexico, we have Bill. Then we have to the to the east, close to Africa, we have Erica. And then we have Danny. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, boys and girls, tropical cyclones get their names according to how they appear and in the in the in the order of what the alphabet is written down. So Anna, in that, in this case, will be the first tropical cyclone for that region for that season okay then we have um danny will be number four and then erica will be number five and that is why we have five tropical cyclones in that and why do tropical cyclones move in an easterly direction ladies and gentlemen i think i've said that in my introduction that it is steered by the tropical easterlies or also known as the trade winds. Okay, then the term that is used for tropical cyclones in this part of the world is a hurricane. 
And you need to know, ladies and gentlemen, what it's called if you in, in the Asian countries, okay? And then you need to know what it's called when it's in uh, next to South Africa. And then the uh, one that does not, also, it's also known as tropical cyclone, but the Australians have a name for it, Willy Wally. So that is also what you need to know, okay? So it can be hurricane, typhoon, tropical cyclone, willy wally, but you need to know exactly in what part of the world it appears. Because otherwise, um, if you don't know it, and that, although it is a one mark question, but every mark counts, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, then number four, two conditions that promote the development of tropical cyclones. Remember, first thing that you need to know, the temperature of the water. Plus minus 26 to 27 degrees. Okay, the water will be warm. And if because the water is warm, we will have a high humidity and that is what tropical cyclones are looking for. Also, lots of and because it's warm water, lots of evaporation. Okay, so now we have air that is uh, raising up, rise up into um, the atmosphere and then we have a very intense low pressure that is created on the surface of the ocean. The one thing that you need to remember also convergence and divergence. So because we have an intense low pressure. Air in the surrounding area will be sucked into that low pressure. That is when we say air converge. Air comes to converge means to come together. That is at the sea level, okay, right on the surface of the of the sea. Then when it rises, the air rises, so we have a low pressure at the surface, and then as it reaches the top of the tropical cyclone, then we say air divert. Okay, so divergence means the air moves apart. Okay. Right, next one. I think we have a. Okay, there's your answers also. And that 2.35. Um, the path of a tropical cyclone can be very erratic. That means unpredictable. Now, suddenly it's moving little north, then it comes down south again. And then it stops a little bit and then it moves and then sometimes it moves very fast, sometimes very slow, then it goes north again. That means the path is unpredictable. So in eight lines, a possible reasons for the erratic path, they follow and why this creates problems for disaster management. Okay, there's two parts that you need to answer. Okay, the reasons for the erratic part. Why does it move north, south, north, south? Why doesn't it stay in a straight line as it approaches the, the, the land? That is one part that you need to answer. Then, why does this create problems for disaster management teams to effectively manage the impact of tropical cyclones? So, you can say the water temperature differs as the, as the tropical cyclone moves over the ocean. The water temperature differs as it goes along, okay? So heating and cooling will always um, happen. Also, the day temp direction of the wind might change a little bit from day to day, and that also influences the path. Okay, and then as it reaches the, the land mass, there's lots of friction to it, and that can also cause that a change a little bit on its path. But now. Disaster management, they are watching this. And remember the one thing that we use to watch uh, what tropical uh, tropical cyclones or whatever happens on the Earth surface is that we use um, satellites or airplanes so that we can know exactly what to do as a tropical cyclone comes into our area. So now the disaster management is watching this and they say, Ay, there the tropical cyclone is now moving. Though. Is he coming this way? Because we have predicted the path of this tropical cyclone said to us by tomorrow night it will, will reach South Africa. It will reach Mozambique. But now it keeps on changing its path. So, so they don't know exactly where this tropical cyclone is going to hit. 
Okay, so they can't predict the location. So they can't say exactly, okay, people that stay in on the coastline expect that there's going to be a storm in your area. If they don't say that, if they don't prepare the people, let's say that tropical cyclones suddenly change direction again, but the people in the northern part, we, there was no warning for them to say, listen, the tropical cyclone is coming. Just imagine the disaster that goes with that. Okay, they need enough time so that they can get all the emergency services together. Right? That is important. We need to make sure. Also, we need to, like what I said to you now, if we don't inform uh, people that stay next to the coastal line that there's storms coming in, waves from the ocean is going to come and we expect flooding from coming from the ocean. Those people must be warned and they must have an evacuation plan. Please move to higher ground or um, get into bunkers, especially where we have the um, in America, people have bunkers or they have safe houses or they, they what they do, they close up the windows and make sure that nothing all air, that nothing sucks their stuff out of the houses. Okay, so they need to make sure also people need to stock up on emergencies, uh, emergency uh, stock. So now if people, if evacuation um, management people can't do that, disaster management people can't say that in advance to people, then people are not going to know what to do. Okay, here, here you go with your answers, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, there that show, the line show. Give two possible, give possible reasons for the erratic part. Like I said to you, there's a, there's two things that you need to answer. And there we have uh, some of the answers there for you for the erratic part. And then we have also the problems that poses to disaster management. Their farmers are not given uh, sufficient time to move their livestock to areas of safety. So that means farmers also need to know. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, when a tropical cyclone comes into your area, it hits urban areas and it hits rural areas. It takes away everything in its path. That wind that blows at 280 kilometers an hour plus. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing can stand in that way. And now we're talking about wind blowing, but also remember it's got a twirly movement also with it. So now you can imagine what happens to it. OK, and then once again, the last answer, cost implications. Remember I said to you that every infrastructure that is taken away well, from uh, with a tropical cyclone that will cost money to put in place again. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, so what do we do? People have to fork out money. Insurance companies have to pay out people and it costs quite the pretty penny. We're talking about in the millions, if not in the billions. Um, I remember Tropical Katerina that was in America a couple of years ago, quite a couple of years ago. That cost in the billions for the American government to put in place uh, all the infrastructure back in place. Um, and I think they're still struggling today to get everything in place. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is tropical cyclones. They would say any four should refer. You should refer to both erratic path and problems that disaster management teams will face. OK. Right now there, ladies and gentlemen, there is tropical cycle of Bansi. Um, and look at the date, 15th of January 2015. That tells us it's in the heart of summer. Right now, that is in the southern hemisphere. And ladies and gentlemen, there we have, and that is number two for that uh, region and season. That is tropical to, uh, cyclo number two. So the name say to us, look at the symbol. The isobars, trans isobars, steep gradient, steep gradient say to us that the wind is going to blow very, very fast and very hard. OK, the movement will be from east to west. And look at the location it is in the Indian Ocean south of the equator. OK, and then we have like an infrared um, image there on the right hand side, top right hand side just to show you the cloud that will come with it. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, that is your tropical cyclones. So let's go over to anticyclones. OK, 
So first thing that we need to do, what we're going to do is factors that influence the climate of South Africa. Okay. So first thing, ladies and gentlemen, the influence of the ocean. So if you stay closer to the ocean, then it means the ocean will have an impact on the climate of your area. So let's look at the warm ocean beacon current. That is in the warm o Indian Ocean. Now, the places on the east coast of South Africa will have warm, moist, humid, humid conditions. So they will have lots of evaporation because the water is warm there. They will have lots of clouds because lots of evaporation because it's warm. Then lots of evaporation lots of clouds and later on we will they will also have lots of rain now if we go to the western side of south africa where we have the cold benguela i think grade 10s 11s you guys in grade 10 or 11 you had a question i use the example of port nolith on the west coast and durban on the east coast that is on the same line of latitude but they have different climate conditions. Why is it so? Because of the oceans that, that we find next to them. Okay, so the cold Benguela that comes from the polar regions bring cold water, cold dry conditions to the west coast. And that brings the temperature of that area down less clouds or less evaporation happens, less clouds will be formed and also less rain will form. And that is why if we go on the west coast, now we go past Bloberg, Malbos, we go Darling, further up north, now we're going like to Springbok. As we go further north on the west coast, we will see that the vegetation is disappearing and disappearing and disappearing. And now we get to the Namibian border and then we have semi-desert. Why is it so? It's because of the cold ocean that we have next to the West Coast that does not bring a lot of rain to the West Coast um, and bring dry conditions, bring cold conditions, okay? And then that is the ocean. And then number two. So there we have we have warm, moist air from the from the east coast, and we have cool, dry air from the west coast. Then next one, the subtropical anticyclones. Okay. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's three of them. Now, my children at my school has given them a name the three sisters. So, okay, I say, okay, let's go along. If that is well, how you're going to remember it, I don't have a problem if you want to call it the three sisters. So they have worked out this for them to understand. South Atlantic high pressure, that is on the, at, on the west coast. And then we have the South Indian high pressure on the east coast. Then we can have in the interior of the country, right? That is the Kalahari high pressure. Now you see that circle that goes over the Free State, goes over the Northern Cape, goes over, it looks like the Northwest Province. We can even include Gauteng also. That is the Kalahari High Pressure as a huge influence in the climate conditions of the interior of the country. The South Indian High Pressure have a lot of um, an influence on the climate conditions on the east coast of South Africa, but it also plays a role when it comes to the interior of the country. Then we have the South Atlantic high pressure that has a huge influence on the climate conditions on the western side of our country. Okay, now the South Indian high pressure, how does he play a role? The interior of the country gets rain during the summer months. 
they don't get rain or let me say the rain reduces in the winter time it's very dry in um, the interior of the country whereas the western part of the country gets its rain during winter months remember the mid latitude cyclone that comes over uh, south africa on the west coast that brings rain to the western side of south africa now how does the indian ocean i'm oh, sorry the indian high pressure plays a role that rain will fall during the summer months in Gauteng or in the interior of the country. And how does the Kalahariya high pressure plays a role? That rain comes during summer months to the interior of the country. And does the Kalahariya high pressure plays a role if it comes to rain not fall during the winter months in the, in the interior of the country? We we'll come back to that one. Let's do number three quickly. The plateau, the escarpment, okay? We all know warm air rises. And as warm air rises, it cools down, okay? Then clouds will form and rain later on. Now the escarpment, that is like the mount where our mountains start. So now the mountains, as you go into the interior of the country, you will start climbing the mountains as we go until you get onto the plateau of South Africa. That is now the interior of the country. Okay, and as that air moves up the up, up the, the the escarpment, that temperature will get will drop, will decrease, decrease, decrease. All right, until we have um, clouds, and it will most probably rain. Okay, but on the plateau. We will find lower temperatures because they are higher up into the atmosphere. Remember what we said in grade eight to nine? The higher you go up into the atmosphere, the colder it becomes. Now, that is what you have there in front of you. Okay? Now, South Indian and the Kalahari high pressure. Remember what I said to you? The interior of the country does not get rain during the winter months. But now why? Now, you don't have the following slides in your booklet. But you have the one on page nine. You have one that identify the three sisters for you. But there's a smaller window. Two smaller windows at the top of that picture. So the picture that you have here in front of you, this is the one that you have in the high pressure cells that affect the weather of South Africa. And then this one is the one that you have in that smaller window on the left and le left top side. Okay, now what happens here, ladies and gentlemen? Indian Ocean on the eastern side of South Africa. Then immediately next to the Indian Ocean, we have the coastal plains that where we have like Turban, and then we have the escarpment going up, 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 and over, and then we're on the plateau. But now, why doesn't the interior of the country not getting rain during the winter months? Come, let's see what's happening. How does these guys play a role? They say the winters are cold in the interior of the country. A descending Kalahari high pressure. So the air inside the Kalahari high pressure is now moving lower over the country. Remember, cold conditions. And what happens with cold air? Cold air descends. And as that is descends, the Kalahari high pressure also descends. But as it descends, it brings an inversion layer on the coastal side of that um, escarpment. Now, if you remember what your teacher has explained to you earlier in the year, an inversion layer does not allow any air to go through. Watch, ladies and gentlemen, during the winter months. That is why, because that inversion layer is now lower than the escarpment, 
that it can't go through that inversion layer and go over the mountains to bring rain to the interior of the country. Impossible. OK, so that is why the Kalahari high pressure plays a role. That is during the winter months. Cloudless, dry conditions, no rain, ladies and gentlemen. The plateau during summertime gets summer. Now the heat hits the surface of the earth. And we say warm air rises. Okay, look on the Indian uh, Ocean side, also air rises. Okay, but now if that air rises, what will happen with the inversion layer now? Ah, the inversion layer is now higher in the escarpment. Okay, so now it pushed up almost 500 meters above the escarpment. No, but no, wait, what happens there next? Come, let's see. Ah, look there. And there, that warm, moist air can now come through. Watch during what season? Summer season. So now the warm air that rise, that pushed that inversion layer higher than the escarpment. So therefore we have now warm, moist air that can reach the interior of the country. And just watch thunderstorms. Oh, and that name sounds familiar. Line thunderstorms. Okay, where does that one fit in? But we'll get to him now now. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the difference between the two. Remember that the inversion layer plays a huge role whether the interior of the country will get rain. Remember, because of warm air that rises, that pushed the inversion layer higher than the escarpment and that allows that warm moist air that comes from the Indian Ocean to go over the mountains, over the escarpment, and then uh, the interior of the country gets rain, lots of rain. Ladies and gentlemen, when I arrived there, I couldn't understand how people can allow such a lot of water running away. But next one, line thunderstorms, ladies and gentlemen. Remember the word appears here on the, on the left hand side. Where does that come from? Come, let's see. But here we have South Africa. Indian Ocean. Um, uh, Dylan, can I ask you a question quickly? If I move my cursor, well, are you guys, can you guys see the movement? Dylan? All right, ladies and gentlemen, Durban. Okay, where Durban is on the east coast of South Africa. Okay, that is where we have the South Indian high pressure. That is on the east coast of South Africa. Then we have on the west coast of South Africa, we have the South Atlantic high pressure. Okay. Cold water on the west coast, Cape Town, Cape Town side, warm water on the eastern side, and that is the Durban, Durban coastline. Now, remember what, we, what I said, on the east coast, we get warm, moist air that comes into the east coast coming from the South Indian high pressure, warm water, and it comes to the eastern side of the country, warm, moist air, lots of rain, ladies and gentlemen. Also, line thunderstorms, as what the previous slide showed to you, happens during the summer months. Can you see the mountains that we have that is located here on the east coast? So that means that warm air goes over that those mountains. But come, let's see what happens on the west coast. Right? Cold, dry air comes from the South Atlantic high pressure, and that reaches the western part of the country. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these two air masses they move towards each other. Now they get to a point where they actually touching each other and it's not a matter of come let's shake hands. No. Ladies and gentlemen, 
that's thunderstorms as what the previous slide show you. That's thunderstorms that will happen. So these two air masses, cold air mass, warm air mass. Density, differently, okay? They don't mix, ladies and gentlemen. They don't like to mix because I am better than you. Let's see what happens. They meet each other at the moisture front. Warm air is pushed up into the atmosphere because cold air that is denser and heavier will dive under the warm air. And that will push that warm air up into the atmosphere, let's say with a fast speed and cumulonimbus clouds will form and then we have thunderstorms, ladies and gentlemen. Now the question that will be asked is, why is it that the thunderstorms, the clouds and the lightning is on the eastern side of the moisture front? Because that is the area where the moist air is coming from. That is why you have the clouds and the thunderstorm on the eastern side of the moisture front. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that is line thunderstorms. That's on page nine. Now we go to our next slide. The subsiding air causes semi conditions, arid conditions on the west coast of South Africa. Now we need to say, just go back quickly. Which of these high pressure? Is it ABC that will bring semi arid conditions on the west coast of South Africa? That one will be the Atlantic, uh, South Atlantic high pressure. That will be A. In summer, this pressure cell is found at a higher alt altitude due to surface heating, and that is the Kalahari high pressure. Remember what I said to you? During summertime, Warm air rises and then it takes the Kalahari high pressure to a higher altitude, almost 500 meters above the escarpment. Okay, then 1.13, the subsiding air forms an inversion layer in winter that prevents most moist air from reaching the interior. That is also created by the Kalahari high pressure. So subsiding means to dive, okay, to come down, okay, and then that air forms an inversion layer in what, what season? We say winter, okay? Summer, uh, in the summer, this pressure cell is found at a higher altitude, 1.12. Look at the word summer, we refer to the season. So then you need to know. The ridging of the pressure cell results in rainfall over the southwestern Cape. I think you should know the answer, the South Atlantic. Then the interaction with the coastal low results in burp wind conditions. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have to come to burp wind conditions, that question, but okay, there's the answer. Also Kalahari high pressure. So how does the Kalahari high pressure plays a role in burp wind conditions and also the coastal low play a role? Okay, there is, with these two, there's a, the coastal low is the low, the low pressure that uh, runs all along the coastal line of South Africa. But how does that coastal low plays a role that we have bergwind conditions? And also remember, ladies and gentlemen, bergwind conditions happen during the winter months. Winter, when heavy dense air with the Kalahari high pressure presses the air down onto the interior of the country. But that air can't go through through the surface of the earth, but we're getting to you now, okay? Sometimes this pressure cell is known as a blocking high when it is in the path of a mid-latitude cyclone that is the South Indian, okay? Then the pressure cell is generally associated with fog and reduced visibility, and that's especially on the West Coast, ladies and gentlemen, that is the South Atlantic. Okay, so now you have the answers for that. Teachers just out there quickly. I'll give about 
30 seconds so that I can just fill in the answers in the booklets. Just to remind everyone, they shouldn't forget to um, complete the attendance register, please. Then, next question. Name each of the anticyclones. This is the three sisters, ladies and gentlemen. I don't have to give you the answer. I think you know by now the three sisters. That is now, one is in the Atlantic Ocean, the one is in the Indian Ocean, and the one is in the interior of the country. And there we have their names. There they are, okay? 1.14. One point four two anti cyclones are associated with stable con stable weather conditions over the interior of South Africa, particularly during winter. Draw a label sketch to illustrate the influence of the interior interior cyclone on South Africa. OK, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give that to the children. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, there's your illustration for 1.42. Okay, give you a few seconds just to give a quickly draw. Look at look at the line. There is a line going across the picture. That is the inversion layer. Okay, we're talking about the winter months. Right, anticyclones are associated with stable weather conditions over the interior of South Africa, particularly during winter months. We remember this cold air. Right, there's not a lot of change that happens in that in that um, um, air as it subsides. There's a lot of um, changes happening with warm air as it rises. That's why we call it this unstable air. Okay. Okay, we can continue. You need to, if, if you do this drawing, you need to show the inversion layer. The inversion layer will be now lower than the escarpment. You need to show the arrows. You need to show the arrows where the uh, moist air comes from and also the dry air comes from. We will have clear skies in the interior, cool, dry winter conditions in the inland. There we have the Kalahari high pressure that will play a role in the interior of the country. Cold subsiding air warms through compression. Okay. Also, you need to fill in that twirly twirly that show and looks at the way is the, the arrow point shows that the air is moving down, subsiding. Okay. Then next question that we have. In a paragraph of approximately eight lines, explain the influence of the intertropical conversion zone, the ITCZ, on the changing position of the three anticyclones relative to South Africa. Okay, now, the ITCZ, that appears in your grade 11 curriculum, okay? So the ITCZ moves where the sun is moving. So when the sun moves north, then the ITZZ will also move north. If the sun moves south, then the ITZZ also moves south. You still remember equinox, um, I think grade nine, equinox and solstice, okay? So as that the sun moves, uh, currently the sun is now moving closer to the equator. So by the 21st, 22nd of March, then we will have the direct rays of the sun over the equator. So now the ITCZ also moves north as the sun moves. Now what happens with the high pressures, those three systems that we're talking about, the high pressure systems that we have, as the ITCZ move north, the high pressure systems, those three high pressure systems, they also move north. Okay, now the sun goes over the equator. Now it stops at the Tropic of Cancer. So by June, then the 
sun should be on the topic of cancer, but what happens to the ITCZ? But also moves, it moves with the sun. But that brings the three high pressure systems that we have over South Africa. That brings it now also north. Okay. Now, the answer there the earth is tilted at 23 and a half degrees to the vertical as it faces the sun. Okay. We now we're talking about the axis. Okay. This causes the ITCZ to shift north and south of the equator from season to season. Okay, remember I talked about solstice and equinox. The pressure belts follow the apparent migration of the sun. In summer, the three anticyclones are located further south of South Africa. That is during summer. Remember now, the sun is now over the topic of Capricorn and the ITCZ also moved south. So that pushes the three high pressure cells further south. In winter, the three anticyclones are now located further north. Remember now? Now it moves northwards, and that is why the anticyclones can also move north. So that is your answer there, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Next one, okay, just to show you line thunderstorms, look at the date. February, still summertime, late summer in South Africa. Okay, let's watch what's happening. There's your South Indian high pressure that brings more moist air that is on the eastern part of the country. The South Atlantic high pressure that brings cold, dry air to the western part of the country. These two air masses that is different in density. Air, warm air is lighter, cold air is heavier, cold air dives under the warm air, push the warm air up into the atmosphere, and these two meet at the moisture front. And there we have thunderstorms. Watch, ladies and gentlemen, again on the eastern side of the moisture front. Okay. Line thunderstorms, the 12th on February, summer still. Okay, let's see what happens. Uh, just one moment, ladies and gentlemen. There's a cold front. Cold fronts will move far South Africa. Look at where the high pressure cell is here. Right? Here's one also. So that push the cold fronts even further south. That is why it does not have any effect on us during the summer season. Here and there, yeah, the cold front will come in. Uh, because there was a difference in air pressure and pressure gradient and therefore wind brings in the cold air from the ocean and then we have maybe a few drops falling here. But OK, but you, I think you guys get the point. All right, here we go. Moisture front. And there we have thunderstorms. OK. Same, ladies and gentlemen. Ah, same picture there. Warm moist air on the eastern side, cold dry air on the western side. Moisture front, also 12 February 2015. Okay. Then this is the guy that I was talking about earlier. Okay. That is your Bergwin conditions. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, teachers, I think I said this to you. Bergwin conditions happen during the winter months. Okay. Now, in the winter months, let me just go back why we say winter months. I just want to take you back to a slide quickly. That one. Okay, winter. Kalahari high pressure, descending cold air, but that cold air can't go through the surface of the earth. Where is that earth going to go? Here we go. That slide quickly. Here we go. That's the one I'm looking for. Okay, let me just make it a little bigger here. Okay, there we go. So what do we need? We need a coastal low. There's the L here on the coastline. There's an L. We need a coastal low. We have a high pressure in the interior of the country. Okay, that's the Kalahari high pressure. We say air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. We say rising air as a rise up into the atmosphere, it cools down. Now, what happens to air that comes down? 
if a that goes that rises cools down surely a that comes down as we heat up come let's see if it happens also there are three things for berg wind conditions to happen you need to have a coastal low that's where we have the l okay you need to have the color high Kalahari high pressure that's in the interior of the country and not too far from there we will have a cold front okay let's continue the high pressure is over the interior of the country we have a low pressure over the ocean of over the sea okay we know a moves from a high pressure to a low pressure Anticlock, uh, the uh, high pressure is anti-clockwise circulation, anti circulation, and we have descending air. But as that air comes down the mountain, remember it comes from the plateau and it comes over the escarpment and it comes down the escarpment and as it comes lower, 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 it eats up and it eats up and it eats up. Okay, then it reads the coastal plains or the coastal line that will be warm dry wind and that can cause fault fires okay so i do it again what do we need for berg wind to con conditions to happen we need a high pressure over the interior of the country we need a coastal low and then we need also a cold front and let's see what happens. High pressure over the interior of the country. Low pressure over the sea or on the coastline. Then we have anti-clockwise movement of the high pressure. That A, like we said, it can't go through the surface of the earth, but somewhere it needs to move. It keeps on pressing down. That A gets warmer and warmer as we press down. And then that starts moving from the interior it moves towards the low pressure to the coastline and as it goes lower and lower over the escarpment it goes lower it warms up and it reaches the coastline as a warm dry wind and the danger that we have is fault fires shortly after that ladies and gentlemen then a cold front will move okay This is now a cross section. This one is a plan view, and this is a cross section of what happens. Same thing, subsiding the air, high pressure onto the plateau, interior of the country. That air can't go through the surface of the earth. Then we have a low pressure over the ocean, and we know air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. Now, because that air can't go through the, the uh, surface of the earth it needs to move somewhere so now we have surface winds and now it moves to the escarpment and over the escarpment and then it goes down the escarpment and as it goes down the escarpment it warms up by the time when it reaches the coastline it's warm dry wind and then go back and then we have fault fires watch ladies and gentlemen during the winter months was a question one time in the exams what season i know a lot of children could not answer it because they expect right berg wind fault fires summertime okay so be careful for that one okay then another figure ladies and gentlemen figure shows berg wind condition then similar picture of what you had this is the one on the left hand side is a cross section and then the plan view is the one on the right hand side okay um, there you can see there we have the coastal low also there air moves if you look at the arrows the air moves from the interior of the country and moves to the coastline then they ask name the high pressure cell at a still remember his name Kalari high pressure okay which season winter months okay with reference to state two conditions under which book winds originate here we go okay we need to have a kalahari high pressure over the interior 
we need to have a low pressure on the coastline. And then move, wind moves from a high pressure to a low pressure because we have a pressure gradient along the escarpment, right? Then if you have a pressure gradient, you will, your teacher would have said to you that when the isobars are closely spaced together, then we will have strong winds. If the isobars are widely spaced from each other, then the wind won't be that strong. So we will have mild winds, okay? All right? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that's all about perk wind conditions. Dylan, I think we're going to skip this, this one, eh? Okay, so that's fine. Yeah, but I, th I think they, they get the point. Yeah, and yeah. they have the questions in the booklet as well. Uh, and the questions are there. Um, I think um, if the teachers did not get the answers yet, then we just need to make sure that the teachers get the answers as quick as possible. So okay, so, so you will send this slideshow to Ms. Prinslow. I'll send this to Ms. Prinslow. Um, and I think she should have it also, but I'll ask her if she can email it to the teachers so, okay. that, uh, so that the teachers can have it. OK, next one, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Dylan, uh, is it possible just to ask the teachers if I'm moving too fast? Are the children still with us? Any questions from their side? OK, so, so uh, yeah, they can hear you and I will type that okay. in the comment box as well. OK, all right. Any aspect, ladies and gentlemen. Here you have, I don't think you guys have this picture in your in your booklet. Um, but I think if we go to page 13, that's a similar picture that we have there. OK, so what does aspect say, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? Aspect say the following. Slopes that faces northwards are warmer than slopes facing southwards in the southern hemisphere. Shall I say again? Slopes that facing northwards or north facing slopes will be warmer than south facing slopes in the southern hemisphere. Similar will happen on the opposite side in the northern hemisphere. All south facing slopes in the northern hemisphere will be warmer than fa slopes facing northwards. OK, that is what aspects say to you. We will. The impact of aspect will be less on the equator. OK, so it, the sunlight is almost right through the uh, over the equator. It just goes 23 degrees north of it, um, or 23 degrees south of it. Okay, that is what aspects say. So, ladies and gentlemen, there we have a line. That red line is dividing the north-facing side that is now on your right-hand side. And the south facing side that's on your left hand side, that's also the shadow side of the U. Okay, you see there's a shadow that will be colder on the left hand side. That's the south facing slope. That slope will be colder than the right hand side. That is the north facing slope. OK. North facing, there's the north, there's the south. Snow on the south facing slopes. And especially in winter, you you this is very prevalent during winter winter months. Okay, that is why boys one day when you take a wife and she wants you to build a house for her. Remember in South Africa, winters can be very cold. You build a house that is north facing. Because that house will be warm during the winter months, because if your windows face north, north northern direction, as that sun comes up in the east, those windows will get the sunlight coming into the house. And that is why we say north facing houses are always warmer than south facing houses. OK, so no snow on the north facing slope, but we have snow 
on the south facing slope. And there's the sun. Sun is more to the north. Okay. That is in the southern hemisphere. Warmer, colder. All right. Shadow zone, zone or shadow side of the of the slope. And ladies and gentlemen, I think this is on page 13. The influence of aspect on the valley slopes is more evident in summer or in winter. I think I've given you that answer. It's more prevalent in or evident in winter. Then we have slopes. We go to our picture at the top. On the, that is X is our north facing slope. And then Y is our south facing slope. Here's the arrow that point to us to show which side is north. Okay, then which slope X or Y receive direct rays of the sun? I think by now, if you know that X is north facing, then he will get more sunlight, okay, or direct rays of the sun. Which slope X or Y will have the highest groundwater content? I think, Dylan, I would like the children to answer that question. Let me hear which, what, school which school will answer that question the fastest which of the two slopes will have the highest ground water content well, do, do we have any response from the children no can we maybe ask Leiden secondary if they will answer for us Okay, Leiden, what do you say? Florida, you want to take a shot? Slope Y. I got Stop. an answer via WhatsApp. I'm not sure who sent it, but okay. they're saying slope Y. All right, beautiful, beautiful. The school who got that right. Tell your teacher that she must send or you must send me a message. They, oh, that is some, Symphony High, sir. Yes, yeah, Symphony, well done, Symphony, all the way from Belar. Welcome, Symphony. Well done, well done. Well, then, will slope X or slope Y be more suitable for crop farming? Is it X or Y? We will take the chance with that one. That is question two. Point one four. Come on, other schools, you can't let Symphony beat you like that. Florida, come. Florida is a school very close to my heart. Florida, Miss Loxton will be very proud of you if you can answer this question. We have a few people tuned in that's not under school's name. So Emma Donis, Trevor Jasper and Daniels. That sounds like te teachers. Those surnames sound like teachers. Definitely. OK. But 2.14, is JG Mayering part of the, the, the tutoring session now, um, Dylan? I'm not seeing JG Mayering school name yet, sir. Okay, good. Okay. Symphony well, says that they think it might be X. Okay, can they most probably explain to us why they say X? Is it Symphony again? Symphony again, sir. You, 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 Symphony. Very proud of you guys. I need to come and visit. Okay. You're right, but why? Let's I see. didn't get an explanation yet, so I think you can just go okay, ahead let's continue. and explain. Okay, it's got something to do with sunlight and the crops. Okay, then is called the shadow zone or the shadow side. I think you, we all know that answer. That is why are settlements more likely to be located at A or B? OK, 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our answer will be B there. Wood Valley slopes closer to the equator be more or less influenced by aspect? I think I gave that answer also. They will be less influenced, okay? Are forests most likely found in slope X or slope Y? That answer is Y. Okay, let me come back to 2.14. Crops needs lots of sunlight. Crops grows at its best. If you give them lo love, water, lots of water and love of the sunlight, then they grow at its best. Let's look at tomatoes. Tomatoes need sunlight so that we can have those beautiful red color of the part tomatoes. If you look at 2.18, okay, are forests more likely to be found on slope X or slope Y? We will find it at Y, okay, because less evaporation will happen there, so there will be lots of uh, moisture in the soil, okay, so the groundwater will be higher at Y, and that is where, why we have forest, okay? That is the difference between the two. Okay, then, go to inversion. Who knows what's an inversion? I'll give you the full picture so that you can see if you can answer. What is an inversion? What is an inversion layer? Okay, so we say, as warm air rises, Warm air cools down. Okay, as it rises, it go higher up into the air, go higher up into the atmosphere, it cools down. But within an inversion layer, that is warm air. Now let's look at the diagram on the left hand side. You have on the left hand side increase in altitude. Okay then decrease in temperature. Now come, let's go to the red line that we have. So as we move up with that red line, we go higher, higher, then the decreasing of that temperature will move to the left hand side. That tells us that's decreasing to the left hand side. Okay, till we get to that first line from the bottom up. Now we're moving into the inversion layer. When I watch what happens to the temperature now, that's not where I want to be. Okay, let's see what happens to the temperature now. Now the temperature is moving in a different direction. So that means now the temperature is increasing within the inversion layer. So we get to the next line. Now we almost on out almost out of the valley. Okay, so out of the valley now we have a that moves in the higher parts, upper parts of the atmosphere. And that again brings the air down because now we're moving higher up into the atmosphere and that decreases also. So with an inversion, what we say with the inversion, as we go higher up into the air, instead that the temperature comes down, the temperature will go up, it will increase. Okay, proper words use increase. Okay, that is what happens. But now let's look at this picture. There we have factories, industrial areas within that valley, people staying there, cars driving along there. And because of that inversion layer, that is warm air, that air traps the pollution inside that valley. Okay, that's what happens. But let's go to the top inversion. Right, warm air rises. Okay, and it goes outside the valley. Then it goes into different direction on top of, of the slope or on top of the valley when it reaches the top of the valley. But okay, cold air sinks down the valley, comes into the valley. Now, what happens to the warm air that is trapped inside that valley? Okay, remember, this is air masses, different temperatures, different densities. Okay, so what will happen if that cold air, air that moves down the slopes, as it comes down, 
it cools down, okay, sinks into the valley. That will force the warm air out of the valley, okay? And because that air comes down and it cools down, it becomes very cold, then we have a frost pocket at the bottom of that valley or on the valley floor, okay? Let's go to the next one. Catabatic winds and inversion, okay? Here we have the inversion. That's warm air that traps the polluted air in this area, okay, in that valley. So cold air comes in. This is now during the nighttime. Look at the picture, say nighttime. There's a moon, there's stars. It tells us nighttime, okay? Then cold air moves down the valley slopes to the valley floor, okay? And as it moves down, it becomes colder and colder and colder. But now, it needs to replace the warm air. Remember the two does not mix, as what I showed you there with line thunderstorms, it does not mix. So as that air moves down the valley, it pushes the warm air out of the valley. Okay, now catabatic winds, ladies and gentlemen, that happens during the night. The opposite of catabatic winds is anabatic wind. Okay, so now how am I going to remember the two? And I think by now, this thing has now spread amongst the teachers, and this is how they teach their children how you're going to remember this. Cats come out at night to hunt, catabatic. Anabatic. Anna comes out during the day. She takes a bag and she goes to work. That's during the day. Okay? Don't forget that, ladies and gentlemen. See this. Okay? So that is. See, next one. Oh, also, let's start on that part. Why is air moving down the slopes? Because we have a high pressure at the top of the valley and we have a low pressure. Remember, warm air creates a low pressure. Cold air creates a high pressure. Air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. Okay, that is the concept that you need to remember. Ladies and gentlemen, within weather and climate, there's a few um, concepts that you need to know that will happen at all time and that is that air moves from a high pressure to a low pressure when we have warm air a hot day then we have a low pressure over the country all right then later in the day the wind will blow but where does that wind comes from comes from a high pressure area and maybe right next to us we have the ocean so the ocean is a little colder than cold air that is a high pressure so air will come from a high pressure to a low pressure that's the concept that you need to remember another concept that you need to remember as warm air rises it cools down as air dives or subsides it warms up those are the concepts that you need to remember. The other one, in well, right through weather and climate, when two air masses come together, mid-latitude cyclone, boys and girls, okay, line thunderstorms, when those two air masses come together, they get to a point where they want to greet each other. But no, I'm not your friend. I'm diving under you because I'm heavier, I'm denser. That is cold air. And because you light, I can pick you up just like that. And I push you up into the atmosphere. Those are the concepts that you need to remember. If you understand those concepts, ladies and gentlemen, then you will be able to answer any question regarding weather and climate in grade 12. Then you should not have a problem. Okay, next one. Temperature inversion in a valley, name the wind at A. That's a catabatic wind because it moves down the valley. Look at the arrows, down the valley, okay? 
Um, then we ask, explain why the wind commonly occurs at night in the valley. Uh, that air gets cold, cools down, right? Through the night, okay, then it moves down the valley. Remember that air is now in contact with the valley, okay? That cold air sinks down the valley. Okay, and they say also gravity plays a role. We know although it's heavier and denser, it will already move down the valley, but also gravity plays a role. Okay, and then dense air sinks. Okay, and as it gets to the bottom of the of the valley floor, it pushes the warm air out, out of it. Okay, explain why radiation fog is likely to develop in the valley at night time. Cool air subsides to the valley floor. Warm air that rises is cooled down to dew point temperature. Air at the bottom of the valley condenses. And that is why we have fog. It's an interesting question somewhere, one year, where they ask why is fog disappearing from the bottom up? valley we have fog in the valley and then the fog disappear as from the bottom of the valley upwards because what happens the surface of the earth first gets warm and that heat that the earth is now absorbing right that is radiated up into the air and it touches the first fog that is in contact with the surface of the earth, and that is why fog disappear from the bottom up. Okay, then paragraph of eight lines, the likely impact of wind A. Now, I need to go to my picture. The picture that we have on page, sorry boys and girls, on page 13, okay? So we have wind A on farming and settlements on the valley floor, okay? What is the impact of that wind on farming and, and settlements on the, on the valley floor, okay? So catabactic winds at night causes cold air to move down the slope, causing frost pockets in the, in the, in the valley. In frost pockets, uh, very harmful to your crops, so you will make sure that you will plant frost resistant crops. So uh, think about sweet potato, that is a hard vegetable, uh, most probably potatoes is also hard. You won't plant uh, tomatoes at the valley because tomatoes won't be able to withstand the cold, okay? The cold condition and frost will kill uh, pest, that is on farming. And then cold condition suits the growing condition of these crops. The crops are not frost resistant, cannot be planted on the valley floor, they will die. And then acid rain can damage crops. That is in the valley. Okay. And the impact on settlements, what will that catabatic wind, what will it, what will the uh, impact will it have on settlements? So the valley floor is cold and damp, and therefore you don't want to go stay there at the bottom of that valley. OK, so valley floor is not suitable for settlement development. Smog, pollution, a polluted air is trapped by the descending air, colder air, and this will lead to respiratory problems, right? So if people can't breathe properly, properly there at the bottom of the valley, I don't think that I want to stay there. I don't think you would like to stay there. Also, the visibility of the, because we have fog in there, and the polluted air in there, um, we will, um, our visibility will be reduced, okay? Then the rate of the accidents will also increase. Of course, if you have polluted air that will hamper your visibility, there's a possibility that the accident level at that area will be high, okay? Acid rain can damage buildings, okay? That is page 13, ladies and gentlemen. If you go to page 14, yeah, I've got a di diagram of valley climates here. Okay. Then anabatic air that moves out of the valley. OK, 
Okay, look at number one. That is the picture on the left hand side. Anabatic, look at the sun. There's a sun over that picture. Okay, so air moves out of the valley. So what happens? The, the energy of the sun hits the valley floor. It heats up the surface in the valley. Now, what happens now? That warm air can't stay there. So suddenly that air will rise up the valley. Okay, that is what happens. Picture B, catabatic. Look at the moon, nighttime. Okay, now high pressure on the top side of the valley, low pressure because it's, but most, but it's warm down there. Now it becomes nighttime. Now that air at the top of the valley cools down, becomes denser, becomes heavier. Now it moves down the slopes of that of that valley and then that pushes the warm air that's in that valley that push that warm air out of the valley okay question name wind one in skits a all oh, right oh, that is your anabatic and anabatic wind state one difference between winds one and two so one appear during the day Okay, and it's warm, and then two happens during the night. Okay, that one is cold and it moves down, down the valley. Okay, then would wind one or two originate if a higher pressure occur at the top of the valley and give a reason. Okay, wind blows from a uh, higher pressure to a low pressure. Now, would wind one or two originate of a higher pressure occur at the top of the valley slope? So wind blows from a high pressure to a low pressure. And then explain why visibility in the valley floor is less on winter mornings and draw a label diagram to support your answer. So winter, cold air, will go down the valley, that's winter time. Inversion will form and that will trap. Remember now, as that cold air comes down the valley, it pushes the warm air out of the valley. Now we have an inversion that will trap the pollution. Okay, so that will cause that you won't be able to see in front of you. And there we have an illustration of what it will look like. Okay. Next one, okay, ladies and gentlemen, similar things, similar questions regarding um, catabatic and anabatic. I think teachers, we will leave that up to you guys um, and just to make sure that the children get them with those answers, okay? And then some also part of catabatic and anabatic. And then they have a few questions also. Now we have um, a, a map that show the contours and the height of the contours. So just will you say anabatic or catabatic will happen here, but okay, that's in the mornings, that first question. But oh, here's the question that I was talking about earlier. The farmer at V, notice that in the early mornings, mist in winter starts to clear from the bottom of the valley as indicated in the sketched sketches below explain why this happens okay i don't see this one in your booklet but why come let's see seven o'clock the morning that is the valley early morning covered with fog from the top down okay now the sun has come up already i'm going to look at the answer now now the sun has come up the energy of the sun eats up the valley floor and now that valley floor is now transferring its heat to the fog that is above it and that is why the fog disappear from the bottom up look at 11 o'clock there's almost no fog in that valley or mist in that valley now come let's look what they say about the answer here between 9 and 11 the sun heats up the slopes of the valley Terrestrial radiation starts happening. That means warm air is starting to rise. Okay, 
thus causing the moist air to evaporate from below, resulting in the appearance of mist lifting. Most of the mist evaporates around about 11 and the valley is almost clear. Okay, hope that will answer. I'll help you with your answer there. Okay, Dylan, how much time do we have? Because I see we stand in on one. Four minutes left. Four minutes. Okay, let's see. Uh, urban climates. Okay. What is an urban heat island? Okay. Um, that is, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, when your city center or your CBD is warmer, its temperature is higher than the area around it. So now let's look at our CBD. Now we're going to the city. And I'm, I think most of us have been in the city. Now we go up Adley Street and we in the CBD where we have those high rising buildings. Okay, now have you noticed that when we go to the CBD at night, in if you amongst those buildings, then it's very hot. If you had a jacket on when you left home, you will get into the CBD or you will get into the city and then you will take off your jacket because the temperatures in a city is higher than the areas around it. So now we go from the CBD. Let's say the temperature in the CBD is 28 degrees Celsius. Now we move away from the CBD. Now we're going, let's say we go to Woodstock, Salt River. Now the temperature would have dropped. Okay. Let's say so two, three, de three degrees. Okay. Now we go even further. Now we get to argument sake, we get to Cryfontein. Now the temperature has dropped now with about six degrees Celsius. Okay. Now the further we move away from the city center, the colder or the temperature will decrease. Okay. Now there we have thermometers, a suburban area or we say the rural area. Okay. Almost rural, look rural to me. Right, we have a high temperature there of about 29 degrees Celsius. But an urban area, and then there we have a CBD, high rise buildings. Okay, there we have a temperature of 41 degrees Celsius. Oh, very uncomfortable. Makes me think of that Saturday that we had about three, four, five weeks ago, where we had that 40, uh, 40 degrees Celsius. And then, in the, why is it that? urban areas or your CBD will have a higher temperature. OK, so in your city, you would have lots of artificial surfaces. So you have paving, you have these buildings that's made out of concrete, you have glass, you have tar. Um, yes, all these artificial um, um, surfaces that we have that absorb all the heat during the day. OK, your high buildings, I mean, if you have uh, a building that is got 26, 27, OK, in other cities we're talking about 40 floors high, then of course that building will absorb lots of heat. Then we're not too far from us. We far from the CBD, we have industries. OK, so now we can think about Epping, OK, that Remember, industries also create lots of pollution, lots of heat. OK, so that also in the CBD, we have many cars because lots of people work in the CBD. Oh, maybe not only the many cars, but the many people that walk around the CBD. OK, they will inhale and exhale like the carbon dioxide. Now, where does that go? That also contribute to the temperature going to increase, sorry, increase in the CBD. OK, next one. OK, there we have an illustration of a CBD um, that's now right in the center. Um, and then we have these numbers. Um, they are lying, they are numbered. They are numbered 33 degrees, 34 degrees, 32 degrees, 30 degrees as we move away from the CBD. Do you still remember what do we call those lines on a map that indicates uh, places with the same temperature. I'm just asking. You can think about it. What do we call those lines on a map that indicate uh, places with the same pressure, air pressure, atmospheric pressure? What do we call those lines 
on a map that indicate um, places with the same rainfall? I'm just asking. Those are the questions you need to know. And those are the answers because that is general knowledge for now. That should be general knowledge for a grade 12 learner. OK, there's another line that we not necessarily found on a synoptic weather map or in on a weather map, but we'll find it on a topographical map and an auto photo map. Right? Contours. What is what? How do will you describe contours? They are also lines, brown lines on a topographical map. How will you describe a contour? OK, uh, so, so just a question quickly. Um, yes, sir. Isotherms, are they then something that they would ask them about? I don't think they would ask them about it, but it can be in a question. Now I would say, if you look at the isotherms, will you say that the, okay, now what is isotherms? Do you see my point? So yeah. if, a, if a child does not know what is an isotherm, if he doesn't know what is an isobar, if he doesn't know what is an isohyet, then he's got a problem because he is not going to understand that the one he's got to do hyets, hydro, hydro, water, yeah. rainfall. Okay. Isobars, what is if your if your dad stop at the garage? He doesn't say test uh, check my isobars of my tires. Uh, I want two bar. Yeah. What is he referring to? He's referring to the pressure of the tires. Okay. Isotherms. Therms, T, T, T for temperature, therms, T, H, E, R, M, S, that refer to temperature, okay? But what I, what I always say to teachers is that by the time when, grade, when your geography learner reaches grade 12, then he should have ge geography vocabulary. Yeah, so when a, when a teacher speaks us about something, a child mustn't have a frown and say, oh, wait, 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 what is this teacher talking about? OK, isotherms, OK, that talks about, now we talk about temperature. He needs to know. It. That is things that you start with them already in grade 10. You install that, right, that they know. There's certain things that my grade 12s say to me, Mr. Silver, Will you please just explain? No, so we understand that it's not necessary. And if, especially we look at map work. By now they should know how to calculate distance, straight line distance, curve line distance. If a grade 12 does not know now, before we even started with map work, he should know those things. I will, I will think gradient should be a problem. That is still something that we need to enforce. Um, vertical exaggeration is something that we need to enforce with them in grade 12 because those are the things in map work that they struggle with. How to draw a cross section of a landscape. That is also a little bit of a challenge to some of them. Thank you very much boys and thank you very much colleagues. Dylan, we'll speak again.